time. Hi everyone. Welcome back to EMP. <laughs> so if you look on the CS125 announcements, CS199 EMP, what do you want to see December 6th? That is today, all day, so there should be a link right there that should make the slides go darker than light again. But then you can follow the link and you should be taken to some place that looks like here. Any questions before we jump right in? Cool, good on life. So I made another survey. So if you didn't manage to take the first one, this is a makeup survey to make sure that you um, get your email slash net ID down. So I check off your attendance. You're free to take it anyway, even if you took the first one. Um, but yeah, just a little fun survey. Um, hopefully there are no questions there. And then weekly links, just for giving feedback. I'm going to leave these open until the end of the year, but you are welcome to add any anonymous feedback that you want to just for EMP over here. And then I also have a topic suggestion form, which is also anonymous, which I probably should have taken that down. But if you want future topics or you want me to arrange some slides, even if we're not going to have EMP next week, that's fine too. Or song suggestions. I do appreciate song suggestions, even if I won't be able to play it. But yeah, questions there? Besides, what's the point? But it's OK. All right, so what have we done since last time? So exceptions and errors, hash maps, and generics. But first, um, I, do, I like to do things a little bit differently. We're actually going to do the ISIS forms first. So do I just have one CA here? I think so. All right. Um, let me see how I want to do this. But I'm going to recruit you anyway. <laughs> so um, what's going to happen is that I'm just going to leave the room and wander around a bunch. And um, let's see. Um, can I have a student volunteer? Um, so I'm going to have you guard the door as I just like wander around so it's still anonymous. And then a student volunteer who is going to make sure that like everybody gets a form and um, fills it out and everything else. And then um, I'm going to make you miserable and make you walk back in the cold and not one of the students to sacrifice. But as soon as all the ISIS forms are done, the student will just pass the little packet over to the CA and he can run it down to the academic office. So do I have a volunteer just run the classroom for? Awesome. So official head of classroom. Yeah, we can round of applause. But <laughs> OK. Yeah, but yeah, so there are a lot more forms in here. So as long as everybody gets a form and if people wander in, um, let's see. Have all of you done an ISIS form before yet? Probably the first one. So basically, there are evaluation forms, so you can give feedback on how I've done besides the surveys. This is the more official version. Um, let's see. Um, questions should be marked in pencil. So if you don't have pencils, I have these little golf ones. So you feel free to uh, come grab one. And it'd be super cool if you return them as well. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. So. Whoever designed these forms, I don't know what they were thinking, but um, the first two items are the most important ones, and they're also the ones that are tucked way at the top where it's super easy to miss. 
So please remember to fill those ones in and then everything else as applicable. And I do take these seriously and I do really appreciate any feedback that you have, which is why I'm going to just be wandering around so you have as much time as you need. So if you do have uh, comments for like the back like open-ended thing, I really do appreciate those. And just I'm always looking to improve things um, as I can. So I do consider all of your feedback so like I do really appreciate your honest feedback. So um, I think that's it for the pink form of things that I'm supposed to read. So yeah, any questions there before I turn it over to our official head of the classroom and CA guard? Cool.
you guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, any questions? All right. Let's go and jump right in. OK, so we saw this a little last week, so I'll go over it um, kind of quickly. But if you have any questions, feel, any, or feel free to just shout them out whenever. But exceptions and errors. So we like exceptions because our program crashing isn't always the answer to when something goes wrong, only sometimes. So there are three main types of exceptions. Uh, the checked exceptions, so this is if you can anticipate something might go wrong and it's out of your control. So this is where the try-catch handling comes in. So if you're, let's say, trying to load an image that doesn't exist, um, that would be something that you would um, probably be able to anticipate, so you would use a checked exception for. And then unchecked exceptions, these are the runtime errors. So they're normally caused by something dumb that, the, that is the programmer's fault. So if you're going off the edge of the array or uh, something else where it's kind of on the developer for um, why the error happened. And then errors, so we don't goof, there's probably no way that we're going to recover. This is kind of the serious issues. If we're going back to um, the codes from like HTTP requests, this is probably a 500. So for example, out of memory. So Java probably can't recover from that. So everything's gone wrong. Abort mission. We don't give. Questions there? So some of the vocabulary, I think the vocab's pretty fun with try-catch. So we have the try-catch block. So this is the actual block of code that you're going to have Java's exception handling control structure. So if, like you have if-else statements, you have try-catch. So try, you try something risky, catch, catch the exception, and then how do we want to react? And then exception E. It's the little exception we throw and catch like a baseball that we can just break open and get the, a little message that something went wrong. And then one of the reasons why I like C++ more than Java is that e, um, C++'s exception method to see what happened is e.what. I think it's entertaining. And then throws. So. Whenever we see um, that method throws an exception, so that means that there's a spot in the code where we could, we reserve the right to stop what we're doing, give up, and then hurl the baseball message that we've given up and hopefully explain why we've given up. Cool on vocab? All right, so things that we have to do. So if we're using a method that throws an exception, even if we know as the programmers that we're never going to cause an exception, we do nothing wrong ever, we're just the perfect little programmers, uh, being a good programmer means trusting no one. So we still have to surround it in a try-catch. Or we can go ahead and continue throwing the exception by adding throws to the method declaration and just pass it on to the next method that was using our method. So for example, loading an image using Java's buffered image. Um, the buffered image isn't going to assume that you know what you're doing when trying to load an image. You could potentially give a wrong file path. So we have to try to load a buffered image and then catch if something goes wrong. Cool there? So some things we can do, we can have multiple catches. So sometimes things are not our fault. Users do dumb things, so they can enter in a bad file path. Sometimes things are our fault, so developers do dumb things. So for example, we didn't take into account a type of valid formatting for a file. So it's useful to differentiate between the two. So we could point fingers and blame the user like, you used my program wrong versus, oh, I wrote my program wrong. Okay. 
So exceptions can be extended too. So you can create your own and you can check out the exception documentation and see some of the different constructors and descriptions and everything else that you could do with exceptions. So for my little example, um, made a surprise Pikachu exception. I wonder what this is gonna end up being. And then I made another class, um, exception-y. So it has one method, public void does anything, and it throws surprise Pikachu exception. So the only thing it does is throw the exception. So I wonder what's gonna happen. So if we go to our main method and we have our new exception -y, whenever this is a new exception -y. And now we're gonna try whenever this does anything. And then we're gonna catch exception E. And when we do it, we'll wanna print E.get message. So when we go ahead and run this, surprise Pikachu. It's surprised because we threw an exception but we knew that we were going to. Surprise. If you blur it, it looks a little bit more like Pikachu, like blur your eyes a bit. Yeah. So we can create our own. So that way, whenever the user does something bad, they'll just be greeted with Pikachu. Oh, where is everything going? So, and as you can see in the documentation, so over here, we're actually making a call to super with a string. So this would correspond to the uh, exception constructor where we can actually put in a string message. So that's why we would see the surprise Pikachu as our message whenever we print out our exception get message. Creating your own exceptions is fun. Exceptionally fun. I laugh at my jokes, so you don't have to, don't worry. Questions there? Cool. Moving on to hash. So pay respect where respect is due, where due stands for determinism, uni uniformity, and efficiency. So determinism, it can convert an arbitrary amount of data into a single limited size value. So if we repeat the computation on the same data, we get the same value every single time. So it's deterministic. Meanwhile, if it was non-deterministic, we would get different values depending on what happened. So we have determinism. And then uniformity. So over many inputs, each output val value is equally likely. So there isn't any sort of like predictability on just following patterns. Um, each value that you can get in the output, you're equally likely as it says. And then efficiency, so the important part is it's, it's efficient to compute, because if it's inefficient, nobody would probably ever want to use it. So hash functions, what would Wikipedia write? So I like Wikipedia's definition. So hash function is any function that can be used to map data of arbitrary size uh, to data of fixed size. And then the values returned by a hash function are called hash values, hash codes, digests, or simply hashes. So if you remember me harping on before about how we have a lot of names for something that all mean the same thing. So the more names that we have for something, the more we can confuse people, which means the more job security we have. So I can continue teaching. And then once you guys get used to hearing hash values and codes and digests and hashes, we'll invent a new word and confuse you more. Questions there? So one of the cool things that we can use this for is verifying data integrity. So for this example, I'm using uh, SHA-256. 
So you probably have seen this a lot whenever you download software or anything or other things off the internet. I don't know if you're like me and you just kind of ignored it like most of the time. So if you want to learn Haskell, because I love Haskell, it's an awesome programming language. So we can actually go over here. Yeah, plugging Haskell. And then I have Windows so we can download the installer. I already did this before. So if we go back over here, we can verify. So Windows, I'll just be able to use this little um, command in the command prompt and then Mac and Linux have their own respective commands. So try this before to make sure it works. So cert util, and then we have the hash file. So what we're trying to do, so this is what happens if we download core for Windows. Things go dark. And then we're using SHA-256. It's going to compute it. You're going to see a long string that looks like this. That's our SHA, and it completed successfully. And now we're going to check to make sure that it downloaded properly so the SHAs match. So I downloaded the core version. So I typically just look at the first couple at the beginning and first couple at the end. So we see the A8, A0, 8, A0, and then 3557, and then 3557. So yay, we downloaded at least the Haskell platform core properly so we can go learn Haskell now. Good times for all. That's actually a good habit to start getting into, especially when you start downloading bigger, more complicated pieces of software and something goes wrong. It's nice to know about it before you've done a bunch of work to try to make things happen when in reality, the um, whatever downloaded didn't download properly. Questions there? Oh, cool. Next. So hash collisions. So if a hash function produces the same hash for two different inputs, this is known as a collision. So meaning if I had a basket of puppies uh, dot JPEG somewhere, and I also had my Haskell installer that I just downloaded, and they both had the same SHA of that really long thing that I'm not gonna spell out, that's a collision. So a collision in SHA-256 would not be good, by the way. But if we're just dealing with hash map or hash tables of our own, we'll probably know what to do and be fine and can react to um, if two functions or two variables or two whatever you're comparing uh, produce uh, the same hash. So hash functions, we're all doomed. So these are some of the um, cryptographic hashes that we'll go over later. So um, if people are still using MD5, um, for a cryptographic hash instead of just a checksum or something. That's bad. You probably don't want to be on whatever site's using that. But SHA-1, the one that uh, Git uses, a collision was actually found last year. So if you remember from just slides, if the size of the hash is large enough and the hash function is uniform, collisions should never happen and the world will end if they do, or at least Git will stop working and his world will end. The, the world's ended. So if you don't believe me, here's a link showing that it's been found. And a collision was a big enough deal to make a website about it. So they have broken SHA-1. Yeah, pretty intense. But actually, GitHub's probably all right. GitHub actually um, 
like takes measures to protect against collision attacks. So Jeff's world is probably still safe. Yay. Questions there? So hash collisions, so the birthday paradox. It only takes 23 people to have a 50% chance of at least two people having the same birthday, which is fun because 23 is my favorite number. And then 70% or 70 people to have a 99.9% .9 chance of having at least of two having the same birthday. So if you like math or Wikipedia, you can find the math slash Wikipedia page there. But in hash speak, this is bad, so we don't make small hash functions, especially if we're doing it for cryptographic reasons. So what does this look like in Java? So Java has a bunch of different implementations. So we have hash map, linked hash map, tree map, hash table, all different flavors of essentially the same functionality. Um, I did find a nice little link if you want to know the differences between those. But most of the differences, at least if you're doing 125, you won't care about at this point or even for a couple of years, maybe not even until industry. So hash map is probably the way to go. And then most other languages call them dictionaries actually, but it's all the same thing. So remember that thing about job security. So dictionaries, hash maps, all that fun stuff. So map is actually the interface for Java. So it's the blueprint of whatever we want um, any sort of map to look like. So, and then hash map is the implementation of map. So we add specific hash functionalities. And then we have to cast primitive types. So int becomes integer, boolean becomes big boolean, char becomes character. So thanks, so Java. I thought it sounded like things Obama, so. <laughs> Thank you, I'm so glad I got a laugh on that. <laughs> but documentation will help with the rest. So at least Java makes fairly decent documentation in my opinion. Questions there? So there are some trade-offs. So if you have a small array compared to the number of items, stuff begins to look like a linked list because we're having a lot of collisions, so we're having to add things to the linked list part. So put and get both begin to look like big O of N, so we get bad time. And then if we have a big array compared to the number of items, so it looks like an array, there aren't too many linked lists hanging off of it, so Putting and getting both look like big O of uh, one or constant time. I don't know why these are flickering more than usual. But if we have a big array, then obviously that takes more space, so we have bad space complexity. But we can do a trick where we resize after a certain um, items to size ratio. So this is the load factor. I believe for Java 10, the load factor is 0.75. So three quarters of the way full, it'll resize. So this way we can am amortize and still um, have decent time complexity without taking up a bunch of space. Questions there? And then, a quick thing on one-way functions. So the first time I was trying to wrap my head around a one-way function, it was very weird to me. I didn't really understand how you couldn't reverse something. So I thought this visual helps a bit. So given two colors, it's easy to figure out uh, what color they make when they mix together, because all you have to do is mix the colors. But how do we get back to the two colors that made the mixed color? So if you had like a paint separator or something, it might be easier, but that's a hard thing to figure out. So visual example.
questions there? Or hash or hash map in general? Cool. So generics, so we let the types be the parameters. So we see this in Java's list and map. So these give us polymorphism. So every object is an extension of object. And then we also get type checking. So compiler errors are a lot cheaper to fix than a runtime error when your code is in production. That's really, really bad if, let's say, a customer discovered a runtime error in your code. That's going to be very expensive to fix. So we like to fail fast with compiler errors. So some of the conventions, so type names, as you may have noticed, are single uppercase letters. So E for element, K for key, V for value, N for number, et cetera. So these aren't actually forced, uh, enforced by the compiler, just like any other naming that you're doing. The compiler is going to go ahead and let you. But be cool if other people are ever going to be looking at your code and you break conventions. That's a good way to get angry emails. But if it's your own code, then do whatever you want. But it's nice to follow conventions. So the way this looks in Java is we get the alligator mouse going, so the less than and greater than. So if we have a binary tree and we want to make it generic, we can use E for element, and then we have an E item. And then whenever we actually start using it, uh, we fill in the blanks or the E's with whatever type that we choose. So again, this goes to integer instead of int, since we have to have some sort of object going. And in Java, the fun part about that, that is they only make you specify once. And then after that, um, you can just put the less than and greater than signs for the constructor instead of the explicit type again. But you can still put integer again if it makes you feel better. I tend to do that. It just brings balance to my life. Cool on that? Questions there? All right. So real quick, even more stuff. So where to go from here? So this is just my own personal opinion. Um, there's so much more out there than just Java and Android apps. So I personally am a big fan of Raspberry Pis and Arduino. So I think that taking up those projects are really fun. and is particularly fun if you miss something kind of like more hands-on and want to play around with stuff. Me, well, this is just kind of on the computer. And then virtual reality, some good starting places. I think that WebVR with A-Frame is a fairly easy way to get yourself going with that, and it's really fun. Game development, getting started with Unity. Unity is a really fun rabbit hole that you can find yourself going deep down into very interesting things. But this is at least a good place to get started. And then if you're into AI or self-driving cars, MIT's deep traffic is super fun. And then other languages that you can look into, C++ is a natural next step, Python, JavaScript, so some fun things that you might want to do over winter break. Questions on things there? Other things not on there? Yeah. Um, I believe so, but C Sharp and Java are very, very similar. So, um, I don't know if you can do C++ or anything in Unity. I know for sure, like, if not 100% is in C Sharp, but. That's the extent of my knowledge. I've only done like very basic scenes with Unity. But any other questions? All right, cool. Well, thank you guys.
guys again and the very best of luck with the rest of the semester. So next week, instead of coming here, you can go to the little app fair that we're going to be having next week. And that should be super fun and extra credit, right? So I um, believe it's scheduled 5 until 9. So I know it starts at 5 p.m. in Siebel, then eventually like make everybody's going to make their way to Follinger, but I'm not 100% um, sure on the exact itinerary yet, but should be fun. It was super fun last year. You guys are all so smart. I hear about all your app ideas, and it's better than anything I can come up with, so I'm excited. I'm really excited. Yeah, cool. So the rest of the time is up to you. Um, Anything else that you want to go over, I'm happy to help, but yeah, thank you.